Welcome to the show. I'm Jason Whitlock, and I'll tell you why I might be changing my mind about Baker Mayfield. And I'm Colin Coward, and I'll tell you why, despite what Tom Brady says, I haven't lost any respect for Bill Belichick. Speak for yourself <laughs> starts now. I think I may like him more today. Awesome show today. Don't adjust your television. I do look this good. All right, hello and welcome. Shout out to my boy Stuart Varney and all you soccer fans watching. Thanks for tuning in. Joining us today are NBA analysts Jim Jackson and Steven Jackson. That's no relation. That's oh, no. all right, let's start in Boston, where the depleted Celtics blew out the Sixers in game one of the Eastern Conference semis with huge games from Terry Rozier, Jason Ooh. Tatum, and Al Horford. Meanwhile, Philly was ice cold from the field, but after the game, Joel Embiid said the real problem was on the other side of the court. This starts on defense, you know. Um, I thought I was uh, I thought we were all bad tonight, so that's not what we are, definitely. Uh, I think, you know, when everybody is on, we're the best defensive team in the game, and, you know, there's a lot of stuff with game plan that we didn't execute. All right, Cal Hurd, have the Celtics taken control of this series? Should they be the favorites? Yeah, I, I watched Bill Belichick last night. Every time the Patriots are in a game, Jacksonville, Seattle Super Bowl, Atlanta, we, we never feel they have the best players. And it always ends the same way. We're like, how did they win? Jacksonville had all the great players. And I'm watching that game last night. And at one point, they are pounding Philly with Shane Larkin, 20-year-old <laughs> Jason Tatum, Aaron Baines, Terry Rozier, who wouldn't start unless Kyrie Irving was hurt, and Marcus Smart with a bad hand. Shooting hand at that. Okay. And they're pounding Philly on a day rest. Like, this is what Belichick does in football. The two best coaches in American pro sports now – are in Boston. One's the football coach mm -hmm. and one's the hoops coach. I think I'm not ready to jump ship on Philadelphia. I I'm going to write this off to a young team feeling itself, reading its press, press clippings, not realizing that the first round of the playoffs is different than the second round. The second round is different from the conference finals, and the finals are different from the NBA finals. And so I just don't think the level of intensity, I think it caught Philly off guard. Boston was more ready. I'm going to wait one more game. Boston at home playing well. They lost all their road games in the previous series against Milwaukee. I I'm going to wait one more game before I jump ship on Philly. Well, a couple of things. I think the Sixers are still favored. I think they're still in that prime position. But what you have, and this is to further your point about Boston. I'm a huge Sealer fan. We play New England. I cringe every time. This year, for first down, end of the game, we got the ball. We go nine yards, but it's a penalty. Now we're first and, t first and 20 instead of second and one. We beat ourselves. New England does it. That's what Boston did. Boston out-executed this Philly team who wasn't ready for the multiple movements and screen and the activity. Because when you, Stephen, you know this. When you're not as talented, what happens? You have to out-execute your mm -hmm. opponent. And you got to think about it. Brad Stevens has been doing this since he's been at Butler. Right. When he got the back-to-back -back Final Fours, he wasn't the most talented team. But they out-executed teams. They didn't turn the basketball over. They shot the ball well from the free throw line. Mm -hmm. All those components, as you saw last night, is what happened in that game. But I still think the Sixers are favored. But this Boston team is going to be tough to beat. I still, I still have this uh, series as, as even, even as, as it would be if it was 0-0. Mm -hmm. um, Philly still have the, the better talent, the, the stars, the two stars, Embiid and Simmons. But B said it. They didn't execute. They didn't follow their game plan. And it showed, it showed last game. Boston came out. They stuck to their game plan. They outplayed them, played harder, and wanted the game more. And it showed. Uh, I think next game they'll make some adjustments. But like B said, next game they'll follow their game plan and they'll be ready. It'll if, be a different, it'll be a different outcome. If I had better ingredients, you were the better chef. Who'd make the better meal? You. Yeah, I have more experience at cooking. Than <laughs> <that>. <laughs> I go out to dinner. Yeah, but, but that, I mean, that margin of error is slimmer too. That, with that, Boston. The chef makes the better meal. There's also, I mean, I like Philadelphia. I said a couple weeks ago, I can't wait to watch them play. I, I go to the TV set more for the Sixers than LeBron. There's four things about the Sixers, though. Do we need to pump the brakes a little? Number one, Embiid got hurt again last night. Markel Fultz is available in a DNP. <laughs> What's their track record? They got hot against bad teams in the East late and beat Miami. Ben Simmons, last four minutes, can he shoot a free throw? Like, I like them a lot. They're still a young team. They, they got, and they got some issues, and I think all of those are legitimate. I, I agree, but I want to ask you two former players that have, you certainly, you won an NBA championship. 
I do. Th there are levels to the playoffs. Mm -hmm. There's a different level of intensity that I don't think Philadelphia was ready for, especially with all the adulation and celebration of what they did in the first round and everybody anointing them, oh, they're going to go to the Eastern Conference Finals. I just don't think they handled the success well. Adulation, I'll ask you about that later. Uh, <laughs> but, but yes, yes, you're exactly right. Making those same threes in regular uh, season is a totally different shot in that second round. You yeah. can't, you know, everybody can't make shots in the playoffs and make them in the regular season. It's tougher. So you're right. It's, it, it's another level of basketball. Each possession is tighter, and every team and every player is not built for those moments. So we'll see. Like Rozier, he's showing us. I'm built for this moment. Kyrie's not around. I can, I can step up and play big. So everybody's not built for this moment. We'll see in these games. But keep in mind, the Sixers had a chance. They broke the league down a couple of times to about mm -hmm. six points, but they couldn't did. get over the hump. Defensively, they got to make adjustments. Let's go back to your Golden State team, mm -hmm. back when you played Dallas. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody figured that Dallas was a more talented team, but you had the better matchup. Right. They couldn't match up with you. You're going to see a little bit of this in this Boston series mm -hmm. where from a matchup perspective, Brad Stevens is going to put Philadelphia players in situations where they're going to have to think once, twice, three, four times, multiple times when they're guarding the ball. Mm -hmm. So now that's going to open up opportunity. You make, you're making J.J. Reddick, Thank uh, Bellinelli, you. you're making point. those guys guard. That's they right. They went at yeah, Reddick exactly. every, chance every chance they, they could. could. Yes. Mistake that the Pacers didn't make against Cleveland and exactly. Kyle Korver we exactly. talked about. Right. All right, to Toronto, where the Raptors, the baby dinosaurs, host LeBron and company in game one of the Eastern Conference semis tonight, baby. After the Pacers took the Cavs a long seven games, LeBron said the series tired him out. Raptors coach Dwayne Casey says, eh, I'm not buying it. And today, LeBron didn't even seem to remember saying it. How do you overcome the challenge of minutes and rest, you know, in the second round? You had mentioned that, uh, you know, that was a bit of an issue. How are you feeling? Oh, uh, I never mentioned it was an issue. You mentioned it was an issue. It wasn't an issue. It's what I had to do to help us get to the second round, and uh, you know, we were about the second round now that we're here. For his career, LeBron plays as well against the Raptors in the playoffs as any other team. Eight and two, highest three-point percentage, second highest field goal percentage, fourth most points. Whitlock, you expect LeBron and the Cavs to run away with the series? No, no, no I, I really don't, and I expect him to win the series. Mm -hmm. But I think this is a seven-game series. Yep. I, I really believe that. And I, I think we're going to see a monster performance from LeBron James. Uh, I, I don't think fatigue is going to be an issue. I think it starts tonight with LeBron being even better than what we just saw in the Pacers series. And I don't know if he can be any better than that, but he will be. This is a seven-game series to me, though. You know, I, I agree it's a long series. These are not knockout artists. Golden State can knock you out early. Houston. These are If these were boxers, this would be Larry Holmes. He's just going to jab, mm -hmm. body shots, wear you down, and we'll look up. Th these teams aren't good enough to knock the other guy out. You're not going to get 50-point quarters. You're not, I mean, this series is going to have 18 guys who are going to play. We've got one superstar, and DeMar Ro DeRozan's good. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a bunch of hard-working mm -hmm. guys who you hope go to double figures in points. This is not, this is not Tyson in his prime here. It's going to be long, at times ugly, at times low scoring. And to your point, I would probably lean LeBron because he'll have the ball late in all the games. Well, I'm, I, I'll, I'll, lean on, I'll lean on Cleveland as well, but I think Le, uh, DeRoz DeRozan's going to have a coming out party. The last couple of years he played against LeBron in these playoffs, mm -hmm. he hasn't li he lived up to what everybody expected. But, you know, LeBron went home, reloaded on his vibranium. <laughs> He's going to be ready. He, he's going to go out there and, and have the game he has. He normally does. We're going to worry about the team, the bench, what they going to do because they playing against a team that has a nice starting five and can go nine, uh, four or five deep on the bench. So it's going to be a good series, but I, I see Cleveland winning it. I, I do, too, and I think from DeRozan's perspective, keep in mind, we were talking about this on your show or on Undisputed earlier, it's been DeRozan's drop-off. Last year, he averaged 27 points. During the regular season, only 20 during mm -hmm. the playoffs. Shooting percentages down. This year, also, his numbers are down 17 points compared to 23 mm -hmm. against Cleveland. So they've done a, Cleveland's done an excellent job of taking one of those players out, out of the equation and has been the Rosen for the most part. So give J.R. Smith a lot of credit for right. that. But from a LeBron perspective coming in, how about the mental fatigue? I don't see LeBron being able to go out tonight mentally and having 45, 50 points. I think what he'll try to do is distribute, get his guys involved. Ugh, I think luck. George Hill has to be big today. Yeah. Coderon has to be big. Because from a mental perspective, we got to understand that you know this, Steve. 
what we're asking LeBron to do and what Cleveland is asking LeBron to do coming off that seven game, mm -hmm. to try to do that once again mm -hmm. on the road against a motivated Toronto team is going to be tough. It's, it's going to be tough. And you got and you know, Casey, he's seen what LeBron did last series against Indiana. He's not going to let LeBron go out there and get 40 a night. But what, what, would, you, what, what would you do? Would you... Stay at home, take away the other opportunity, say, LeBron, you just got to get your 50. You got to take away, you got to take, you got to guard LeBron and let the other guy score because they haven't done anything all year. What has the bench done? That's all we've been talking about is Cleveland bench. Let LeBron get his. I mean, stop LeBron and let these other guys score because they haven't scored all year. By the way, I know you think sometimes Whitlock, he's a relegator, but there's no other great player in the league other than LeBron who drives to the arena for a series and has no idea who's going to play well. <laughs> Steph knows KD is. KD knows Clay is. Listen, even now with the Celtics, Horford's going to play. Rozier's going to play. Mm -hmm. Jason Tatum's going to play. There's a little added dimension to why LeBron is going so crazy dominating the ball. When you drive to work and you don't know who's going to show up, Every other guy in the playoffs does. Well, you got to want other people to show up. Exactly. You have to play a style that allows people to show up more often. And I'm not dumping on LeBron. He's a unique talent. If he's got so many skills. He's got every skill uh, that, that it's almost too much talent. And so I, I'm not blaming LeBron. I, I'll say this, though. I, I disagree with you all in terms of if LeBron starts dropping 45 and 50 on Toronto – they're going to melt. Mm -hmm. they're, mentally, they're going to melt. DeMar DeRozan, yeah, the yeah. Raptors. DeMar DeRozan, Kyle Lowry, these, they can't take it when LeBron beats up on them. I think it's intimidating to them. And then I think DeRozan will put pressure on himself mm -hmm. to try to match LeBron, which he cannot do. Jim, you're the only person in America on this planet that thinks LeBron can't handle that seven-game series and then come back and beat no, no, up on the No, no, I didn't say he can't handle it. I said he's going to approach it a little bit different. I think his approach to the game, think about how LeBron thinks. He's going to come out and, and regulate a little bit more. He's going to come out and try to get players involved. I'm not saying that he's not going to get his numbers, but I'm saying he's not going to be, I don't think he's going to be ultra-aggressive at the beginning of the game because he needs his teammates to get involved early yeah. and build off what they did in that fourth quarter. The, yeah. Ra the Raptors, I hate to use, no, I really don't. They're a booty call for LeBron. <laughs> so, do you take it what? easy? <laughs> but you, have, you think about LeBron. No, LeBron has a tendency. He plays extremely hard and well one game. He'll come out and be passive the first half of another game. That's just his M.O. But he, he has to show more confidence in his teammates because that's the only way they're going to win this series if the, bench, if the other guys play well. Mm -hmm. That's the only way they have a what chance. What does it tell you that Tristan Thompson was the step-up guy in the last game? I mean, they had abandoned Tristan Thompson. LeBron, if you'd have asked him driving to the arena, he's like, God, I hope Corver's hot. Well, I hope JR's you hot. You know what it tells me more than anything? They don't know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> Why did they have Tristan Thompson sitting on the bench doing nothing? To me, that's the only thing that scares me is I don't Tyron Lue hasn't committed to anything as of yet. Welcome back. Joined now by Fox NFL analyst Greg Jennings. So nice to have you here. It's great to Need be here. Need that big house in Minneapolis, the small <laughs> suburbs. Oh, my God. Jason McIntyre, founder of The Big Lead. Let's move to Cleveland, where the Browns surprised a lot of people by drafting Baker Mayfield first overall. According to Baker Mayfield's agent, you can always trust those guys, <laughs> there might have even been a bigger surprise if the Browns had passed on Baker. We had another team which is going to surprise you. Um... Another team had said, you may get a big surprise on draft day at number two mm -hmm. if he's available. And it was the Patriots. I don't know. We thought, boy, that's going to be a heck of a move to get up that high from where they are. Right. And, of course, he wasn't available, so nothing. We never, we never knew if that was a real, reality or not. All right, Whitlock, does this validate Cleveland's decision to take Baker Mayfield number one? What it does, it just screams NFL people, football people, love Baker Mayfield more than you and I. Uh, and so I'm willing to say I must not, I must be missing something. I have a bias against short quarterbacks. I like them six foot two or taller. Uh, but clearly football people love this guy. And if the New England Patriots had him graded high, I now understand a little bit more why the Browns are all in on him. 
I, I, he's just, just not my particular cup of tea. Okay, so what did you and I establish over the last month with the Patriots? Belichick and Kraft have, have not great in the room with players right now. So they told us they were going to draft Lamar Jackson, had two opportunities, passed on both, right? Now, that was the thing they were going to do. Now they tell an agent who represents lots of players, hey, we may surprise you. They didn't. How do I know this stuff is true? They told me they were going to go after Lamar well, Jackson. Number one, the number yeah, two pick wasn't available. Two. Well, but again, you can tell people a lot. You can, I mean, I, again, Lamar worked him out twice. This had. I always saw Lamar as a second round pick they had evaluated. That, that if he was there, then so the you buy round. this? Yeah, I think there may be some truth to it. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a lot of smoke. It, it, whether it's a lot of smoke or not, it doesn't validate the Browns taking Bay Baker Mayfield number one. They liked what they saw. And on a lot of teams' draft board, Baker Mayfield was high. He, this is an accomplished collegiate quarterback, Heisman winner, finished fourth and third in 15 and 16. I mean, he's, he's played at a high level, and he's gotten it done, and he's found a way to make these guys in the locker room and it, within that huddle buy into who he is and what he's able to do for that unit offensively. I like Baker Mayfield, and I like John Dorsey saying, I wasn't here when they, the, the prior regime made the mistake of Johnny Manziel. So what? This guy may resemble some of the things off the field sometimes, but we know who, what we're doing. We believe in who we are and what we're trying to get done. We're not going to deviate. This is the guy we like. I think that was a bold, bold move. First of all, I don't believe this story at all, but I think it, it, the mere fact that this agent is saying this is a bigger red flag on Baker Mayfield, okay? Think about it like this. They won. Baker Mayfield went first overall last week. Here you are four or five days after the draft trying to convince people, hey, man, the Patriots wanted this guy. The Browns made the right decision. I mean, this is like, what are you doing? What's the point of saying this? Where's the win here? Like, what are you trying What's to accomplish? The downside, the downside well, is the you Patriots could have leaked never... information that the New England didn't want out. Well, New England would after never, fact, ever no one cares. Yeah, no one cares. I don't this know. Was a, this was a guy gossiping on a radio show. This is like what I live for as a broadcaster <laughs> and as yeah. a journalist. An agent telling me, hey, here's what's going on behind the scenes. The information at this point is inconsequential. You don't think this is still an allegedly? I mean, the Patriots will never dispute that. No, Bill no, Belichick I, it's will all never. allegedly, right. but you know how many times... I've known you for 10 years. You know how much alleged information we've exchanged back and yeah, forth? Yeah, but that's on a lesser scale. Way. This is big money, million-dollar stakes. That's hurting no one. By uh, the way, New England also picked Ryan Mallett. It's not like they're perfect with quarterbacks. This stuff's hard. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it, if we look, the only reason why we're even having this discussion is because it's the Cleveland Browns, and their track record is has been horrendous when it comes to first round draft picks, it's specifically at the quarterback position. That's fair. It, it, if this were anyone else, we wouldn't even be talking about well, no, this. No, listen, if they had taken Sam Darnold, it would not be an issue. This is a six-foot quarterback going first overall who has an ugly arrest on his record, who played in the Big 12 where they don't play any defense, and, and he carved up a bunch of bad teams. Like, this is a quarterback with a lot of questions. And all this stuff about every team wanted Baker Mayfield, I don't necessarily buy that. I believe this is a lot of alleged stuff. Yeah. And Baker Mayfield basically went into that interview and won over the room in Cleveland, and they took him. Here's, here's where I think you're a little bit astray is, at this point, they don't need to rehabilitate Baker Mayfield's reputation. He went number one overall. No. What's going to dictate it from here on out is what he does when he puts a helmet and shoulder pads on. Without question. He's going to control the narrative with his play and performance. So I don't think this is anybody trying to rehabilitate, trying to justify the pick. If there was a scam run, it was before the draft, <laughs> and it worked. This is just the, the story behind the story, behind the scenes. Who doesn't love this kind of stuff? Listen, I think you, both you and I have said this. I don't think he's a bust. I don't think he's Manziel and Tebow. I never have. Now, I wouldn't tie my franchise to him because of the v video and that stuff. But I've always said I think he's Case Keenum. Case Keenum went 13-3 and three this year. <laughs> I'm not saying he can't play in the NFL. If this was Manziel and Tebow, they chose a guy that most people had as the third guy on their board. Right. He's not a disaster. 
You think most people had Baker Mayfield as the third quarterback? Yeah, I think most people had Darnold and most people had Rosen. Just think about this. You're just saying that he was Case Keenum, essentially. That's what he is. And the Browns took him number one overall and passed on Sam Darnold. Their fans right now are freaking out that they butch butchered the first pick and the fourth pick, where they should have taken Bradley The only Cup. thing that's going to change that, though, is what happens on the field. You're not going to talk the fans into being happy. It's and the fans don't need to be happy. It's May 1. They need to be happy come September, the second week in September, when the NFL kicks off, and we'll find out if the kicks Exactly. Play. When, when you look at look, – let's look at Josh Rosen. If you take his size away from him, are we talking about Josh Rosen? Yeah, but you can't you can take that exactly. size. You can't do that. But right. my point is, this is why we're knocking Baker Mayfield, because he's undersized. He's not the prototypical guy. He's not that quarterback that you want to see walking off the bus, if you will, that's going to lead your team, because we typically don't see that. It, that's not what we are familiar with. But this kid has won games. He's perform he performed better than Josh Rosen this year. Who's Wait, Did he not? All right, welcome back. Greg Jennings and Jason McIntyre are back. Let's move to Tom Brady, who just made an appearance at the Milken Institute Global Conference where he engaged in a wide-ranging Q&A with Jim Gray. As usual, Gray made it a point to ask some hard-hitting questions. Do you feel appreciated by them, and do they have the appropriate gratitude for what you have achieved? I plead the fifth. <laughs> Man, that is a tough question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everybody in general wants to be appreciated more at work, you know, in their professional life. But there's a lot of people that are appreciate me more than, you know, way more than I ever thought, you know, was possible as part of my life. Do you know why Malcolm Butler didn't play? <laughs> it's what all of you want to know. You can moan and groan all you want. They yeah. want to know the answer to that. Yeah. I, I wish you would have played, but, you know, the coach decided not to play him, and... Um, you know, we still had a chance to win. For a team, this is, you know, this side of the room is the offense, and this side of the room is the defense. We don't interfere with them much. I didn't know. Malcolm kept coming over to me during the game. He's like, come on, TB, let's go, you know? And I kept going, what defense are we in where Malcolm's not on the field? Are we, <laughs> is it like, you know, short yard, goal line? And then after the game, I found out. So I just didn't know, and I asked Malcolm, and Malcolm said, I don't know, coach has just decided something different. And I said, okay. So I don't know what was a part of that decision making, but... You know, I know we were trying to win the game. I don't think we were trying to do anything but win. All right, Calher. Brady also skipped voluntary team workouts. Are you okay with how Brady's handling the offseason? Yeah, I mean, listen. Michael Jordan's Hall of Fame speech, he was still testy. Tom's a driven guy. Tom lost a Super Bowl. Tom probably hates his off-seasons when Mario Manningham and David Tyree make a catch or they lose. Tom's probably pissy all off-season those. Tom's really happy and stays an extra week in Costa Rica when Edelman makes the catch or Malcolm Butler intercepts Russell Wilson. Tom's off-season has been that of a superstar who lost a huge game. He's been at times, you know, a little unhappy. He seems to have gotten over it. That didn't <laughs> seem good. <laughs> he, <laughs> Malcolm <laughs> Coach. Malcolm Coach. You know, one guy's name, the other guy is just coach. Well, he is coach. Yeah, he's, he's been with this guy for 18 years, and you don't think he ever calls him Bill when they're on better terms? Again, I like the way he's handling the offseason because somebody needs to put some pressure on Bill Belichick, and Tom Brady's about the only guy that can do it. And so I'm glad he skipped the OTAs. I'm glad he's talking about this very publicly. He's basically trying to shame Belichick into an explanation because he owes <laughs> Patriots fans and the 53 guys on that team and the ownership and the season ticket holders, Belichick needs to explain that damn decision. Because he called him coach? <laughs> <laughs> if I'm on TV saying, talking about my co-host, my co-host, instead of calling... Oh, hot shots! People would be like, damn, what's up? <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm, perfectly, I'm perfectly fine with it. We have this this idea of what we think quarterbacks and how quarterbacks should carry themselves all throughout their career. And Tom Brady, up until this point, has always been that, that trademark. For the first time, we're seeing him rebuttal and speak out and say things that we've never really quite heard him say and do things that we've never really seen him do. He has earned the right to do that. He has won a lot of Super Bowls that no one else has won. He has been a, the, one of the main reasons 
if not one of the only consistent reasons on, as a player that affords them the opportunity to be in the position that they're constantly in year in and year out. Bill Belichick has a role that he's played, but Tom Brady, you take him away from this team, we're not, they're not the favorites to win this year again. But because they have a Tom Brady and all of a sudden he's speaking up, finally, in my opinion, I, if I was in that locker room, I trust. I guarantee other players. Tom, man, you need you 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 need to say something. <laughs> Thank you. You need to say something. Yeah, I, I'm listen. I'm with you. He has been the one constant over 18 years. The wide receivers are interchangeable. The running backs move around. He's the one that's been there. I kind of like what he's doing this offseason. Think about this, guys. He is a MVP quarterback at the age of 40. He goes to the Super Bowl. This stuff has not been done before. And Bill Belichick still treats him like the second-year quarterback in the film room, undressing him, joking about the Foxborough High School quarterback coming into the room and completing a pass. And I just think Tom Brady's kind of sick of it. You know, like your senior year in high school, right? You've been under your parents' wing the whole time, and you want to spread your wings and get out now. And you don't want to come in at 11 o'clock when it's bedtime. And you don't want to listen to them for curfew. And I think Tom Brady, honestly, is sick of it. He feels, listen, I've done stuff that nobody's ever done. I'm ready. I think Greg makes a really good point here, is that Tom heard from players. You know, Brett Favre, at the end of his career, lost a connection to rookies. I remember reading his story, and it's like, Brett was 40, and they're all 20. Brady, in the last several years, has gone out and hired somebody to update him on all the technology and the music. To Greg's point, some of this is Tom thinking, I'm going to play for three more years. I have to have credibility with 24-year-old teammates. This sort of aloof, detached coach, Instagram, probably plays pretty well in the room with 25-year-old corners and wide receivers. I think of what you're saying is true, but it's not more true then he was asked a direct question. Do you feel appreciated by Bill Belichick and the Patriots? And he pled the fifth. And you want to sit here and act like there's no problem here? When you played 18 years for a guy, delivered five Super Bowls, carried him to eight, and you don't, he can't public, yeah, I feel appreciated, of course. You don't think there's anything to read into that? No, I do think they've had, Big Ben and Tomlin, Big Ben takes shots at him during the season. They ain't won five Super Bowls together. Uh, well, Marino had his... They shoot. didn't win one Super Bowl <laughs> together. Well, Jimmy Johnson and Aikman didn't always <laughs> get along, and they won plenty. I think this thing is being overstated, but I do, to your point, think we got a little tension here. Elway and Shanahan, Aaron Rodgers, McCarthy. Hey, I, don't, I don't think it's being overstated. I, I don't think it's being overstated. There is, there is something going on. You buy into that coach thing? I don't really care about that. People, we as media, we we pick apart everything. But when it comes to the players, you look at his relationship with the guys in the locker room. He has a great relationship with the young guys in the locker room as well as the veteran guys in the locker room. Everyone always, the young guys always talk about Tom Brady this and how he's how they get along with him doing this and that. Brett took himself out of the. He still had great relationships. He did, he didn't get dressed in the locker room. He had his own office, so there was a disconnect. You, you yeah. understand what I'm saying? Yeah. With Tom Brady, there is no disconnect inside here's, the locker room. Here's where the disconnect is happening between Belichick and the players. And so I want to put you and everybody, have you lost any respect for Belichick this offseason? No. None. Zero. <laughs> On a scale of 100, if the <laughs> respect was at 100, it's still at 100. You're talking about none. Okay. Warren Buffett did not invest in Amazon and lost $500 million. I'd still give my portfolio to him. If everybody in the league could choose a head coach today, we'd all choose Belichick. We would. Who, who would who you would? choose? <laughs> we would. Malcolm Butler would. Well, no, Nate no, no, Solder no, no. would. I said if every team in the league didn't have a coach, and you'd say, Jason, you're a GM. Who's your coach? You'd pick Bill. <laughs> I would have I would have 10 years ago, five years ago. The Malcolm Butler decision is selfish. That's why Brady still has a problem. The guy's ego is out of control. Someone's got to hold him accountable. No, today I would not choose Belichick. I would because the man won't even explain the dumbest decision in Super Bowl history where he cheated 53 other guys out of the opportunity to win a Super Bowl over some BS. No, I've lost respect, not all. I've uh, lost some respect. I've always been a big Bill Belichick guy. So let, uh, on a scale of 1 to 100, let's say I was 95, 
What are you now? 70. Oh, 75. Well, Jason, how about that? That's a lot. Uh, what if yeah. I said, based on the draft, that I gained some respect for Belichick, and here's why. They could have easily traded up for Baker Mayfield or gotten Lamar Jackson, and guess what the topic would be all offseason? Well, they got Tom's replacement. Tom's looking over his shoulder. Belichick didn't draft a quarterback until, what, the sixth or seventh round, Danny Eatling. Is that not an olive branch? Hey, Tom, you're my guy. You're going to be 41. I'm not going to draft a quarterback early. Sound like an olive you're branch my thing. guy. I don't think he heard it as an olive branch. Did you hear something about an olive branch? I heard mm -hmm. him plead the fifth. I heard him call him coach. The draft had happened when this interview happened. I don't think Brady saw it as an olive branch. Not at all. And I, I haven't lost respect for Belichick. I have You've lost none. I've lost. When you say. The Malcolm Butler when decision, you, none. I question Bill Belichick now. Where in time in prior is like I, how can you question? So what him? do you question? His integrity? Absolutely. And I I question his delusion that you can make that decision okay. and feel like there's 53 guys you stand in front of every day. Do your job. Team over everything. You sit and preach, 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 and then you do something stupid and you don't have to tell anybody. Do you anything. question Steven Spielberg's filmmaking after Indiana Four, Indiana Jones Four bombed? Do you question his filmmaking? You don't question Belichick's coaching. You didn't yeah. like a personnel move. Yeah. But to In Jason's, the Super Bowl. Jason's point, he makes a, you make a really good point. And I think that's where a lot don't of the players... No, I think that's where a lot of the players are at. And I think that's really where Tom Brady is at. You tell us every single day to do our job. And the one time in, in the biggest game of all of our careers, you, you do this and we're trying to do our job. You don't let one of our better players do his job because of some person, whatever and it is, don't explain. and don't explain okay. it. That, Jason, that's... on some level, though, he is ruthless. This is who Bill Belichick has been in his entire career. Take your favorite show, The Wire. How many characters on that are ruthless and do things that maybe you don't agree with, but, man, he is a ruthless leader. That's what he does. That's what got him here. Yeah. Some guys in business, you like to reference these business guys, Sometimes they've got to make ruthless, brutal decisions that not everybody agrees with, and it gets okay. you to the top. And let me say, if it was a ruthless, it's not a ruthless decision we're debating, though. It's a stupid decision. <laughs> There's 53 people in that locker room think that was stupid. Okay. There's uniformity on that. So it's not about, but he, we know Belichick's ruthless. He just did something stupid, and he's so arrogant now that he doesn't even think he has to explain I don't think it was as stupid as you think in the previous two playoff games. Blake Bortles and Marcus Mariota. That they won. The no, final no, scoreball, right. they won. Those two, against Malcolm Butler alone, had a quarterback rating of 146. They shredded him. They won. Well, what, New England was a play from that. Do you think? Who do you think knows more, Tom Brady or you? Or that uh, well, completion Brady. percentage versus Malcolm Butler? I'm going to take Tom Brady's yeah, word and also, everybody else on that damn team. But Tom's emotional. He's emotionally vested, so of course he's angry. It, it didn't affect my legacy. It affected his legacy. Thank you. And that's why the man needs to explain it. If we all in this together, he has to be accountable, too. It, it would be like me sitting up preaching, oh, Colin, you're eating unhealthy. And you'd be like, what? Didn't I just see you with a slab of ribs? That's great. <laughs> again, you can't do what Belichick did okay. without explaining it. Nobody has ever, no doctor's ever said ribs are unhealthy, so I don't buy your premise. <laughs> ribs are delicious, always. All right, welcome back. Steven Jackson's back. Now Fox NBA analyst Chris Broussard. Let's move to LeVar Ball, who announced last week his family's career in Lithuania Pro Hoops was coming to a premature end after a few short months. Even the Lithuanian press was done with the Ball family. A reporter saying the country got bored. The whole experience was, quote, sad. Whitlock, are LeVar Ball's 15 minutes up? They might be, and LeVar may be responsible for running out the clock. Uh, he's destroyed LaMelo's career at this point. So, yeah, I think his 15 minutes might be up. Lonzo's still his son. Lonzo's still a Laker. He's in the, he's in the outrageous business. And... By the way, Lithuania, you can say stuff and nobody hears it. He'll come into L.A., Lakers go on a four-game losing streak, he'll question Luke Walton, and you and I are on debate shows and interview shows and people will talk about it and it'll be in the L.A. Times and all of a sudden it's on USA Today and it ignites a fire. I'm with you, Colin. As long as Lonzo's still in the league, he's going to have a platform to speak. And next year the expectations will be higher for Lonzo and for the Lakers to win more games. So he's going to have more to talk about. And with Jello and Melo kind of out of the picture, now it's all about Lonzo, at least out of the picture for the time being. It's going to be all about Lonzo. 
it's been nice these few months when he's been gone because we haven't heard a lot of this, which usually the media wouldn't say that because it's fodder for us. But it's been nice that he hadn't made these comments. Next year, he'll probably ratchet it up with the Lakers. I think it's over for him. But if he can get that league that he's trying to get going, I think that'll give him the platform he needs. Yeah, good Young luck with kids that. are not – yeah, a lot of the McDonald's yeah. All-Americans are like, please. Look, they had 10, guy, 10 people in that Lithuanian gym. They said the Facebook views were down to three or 4,000 people viewing from 100,000. The clock – is ticking and running out on the barbell. You don't bar think ball. another outrageous comment by him, though? I think we're used uh, to it. It, it. it would be like, by the way, you know, walking on me with a double cheeseburger. You wouldn't be shocked anymore. <laughs> Listen, remember <laughs> Snooki from Jersey Shore? Uh, She's back on TV. Outrageous. <laughs> it took a few years, though. She left for a couple. So, so maybe they go for it. If Snooki's still around, LeVar Ball's got a life. You got a good point right there. <laughs> All right, let's get it on that one. To San Antonio, where the drama between Kawhi Leonard and the Spurs is still percolating. Reportedly, Kawhi and his camp resent the team's closed-mindedness about his injury and their apparent efforts to pressure him to return, with one confidant saying they're making him look bad. You have this seamless transition from the Duncan era to the new era, this homegrown superstar. Like, why would you alienate him? Cowherd, do you think Greg Popovich can repair this relationship. Those are real quotes. I've said before, Kawhi is different. He's different. He's nonverbal. He hires an uncle to do his business. Trust is big. In high school coaches and college coaches never gave him love. This is a young man who's not verbal, who doesn't trust a lot of people, walks into a fishbowl in San Antonio, and the coach calls him out. Good luck repairing that. This is, this is the first star that Pop can't control. He's not from Argentina. He's not from France. He's not from St. Croix. He's from San Diego, right here in California. He thinks different. This is the first superstar, and I will say this on TV, that Pop has had that has braids. This is a different type of superstar you have now, Pop. So, Pop, so he wants to do things his way. But Pop can fix this relationship. Give him the Supermax. Money always fixes things, especially when he wants what, he, what he's worth. I think if they, don't, if they don't improve that team and give him what he wants, I think he'll walk. Yeah, I've been told from Kawhi's side that, look, they, they're saying Pop is so confident in his ability to repair relationships like he did with LaMarcus Aldridge mm -hmm. that he thinks he's just going to put his arm around Kawhi and say, hey, that was just to, you know, get these guys fired up or get you on the court, give them confidence, whatever. It don't work with real and, ones. And, and that's what they, I was told. Look, I was even told if the Supermax is offered, it's not a certainty mm -hmm. or a guarantee they would take it. I'm with you. I think they would. But that's what I was told. So he's got a long way to go to repair this. But he, Pop look. is old. Right. If I'm the Spurs, do, does it ever cross my mind, hey, maybe it's a good time to transition to a different coach if we have this young player that we think has another eight years left? Does Pop have eight more years left? W would the Spurs ever consider... Maybe it's maybe it's the pop's wife just passed. Maybe it's a time for him to think about retiring. Well, I, 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 me personally, I thought he was gonna step down once Tim left. That relationship was so tight. I thought once Tim, reti with Tim retired, then Pop was gonna step down. But it may be time for that. But how can you tell a great coach like that that it's time for him to step down? Yeah. But Kawhi, I know Kawhi, I, and I, I talk to him a lot of times. He loves San Antonio. He loves being a winner. And if he can go somewhere else and still be a winner and still be a great player, that, that's a great option. See, there's this perception, and you know Kawhi, you play with him. There's this perception that he's not that smart because he doesn't talk a lot. Right. But tell us, I think he is very smart, and that's what I'm told, too. It's no other player in this game that wants to be the, one of the greatest when they retire. Kawhi wants to be one of the best players to ever play this game. He's focused on that. And he understands that he don't have to say it. He gonna walk it like he talk it. He gonna go out there and just prove it in his game. He doesn't have to, he's not one of those guys that's gonna go out there and talk. He's a great teammate, he's not a negative guy. So when they came in the, in the, in the, in the media and was kind of going at him from the teammate side, from Tony Parker and Ginobili, that's unusual from the Spurs. And they caught him off guard because this never happens in this organization. So all of a sudden, the team's not good and things are not going y'all way. Now y'all gonna come at me? It's not right, you can't do that with your star. That's to me why, okay, let's say you don't move away from Pop, but maybe his old school guys, Tony Parker and Manu, 
Maybe they need to go so it can just be clearly Kawhi's team and not Pop and his good old boys. That's holding him back. Yeah, Manu, again, is great. You know, he can average eight points at 40 years old or whatever. Man. But maybe it's time to move on uh, from him and Tony Parker. Listen, I, this story from the very beginning has been fascinating to me. A star player basically disappears from his team. And every time I read it, between your sources, between Ramona Shelburne, between, you know, who at Woj, the sources are all saying the same thing. Uh, Kawhi's side's not happy. And it can't all be the same source. This stuff's getting out, and it's getting out because people want it out. I think Kawhi's camp is deeply hurt and has lost trust. Well, and I, I'm told that they, they're like, whenever we see the Spurs, it's all good. Mm -hmm. Like, in our faces, Kawhi's there's... Yeah, yeah, they're saying, I mean, they've got trainers up in New York with Kawhi. Mm -hmm. They knew we were getting a second opinion. They, they said it was okay. They, they knew we were going to be in New York during the playoffs. They said it was okay. We see Pop, you know, there's texting here and there. And then we see these anonymous sources coming out, ripping Kawhi, and they're like, it's not coming from us. Right. Well, it must be coming from you. So there's some two-facedness there. And, yeah. and then you got Tony, Ginobili, Tim. They've all went through injury. Have they, any one of their injuries ever been questions? Questioned? This is the first, this is a defensive player of the year, finals MVP. He's not playing things and not going your way, San Antonio, all of a sudden. Now you're questioning your start. It never happens in the organization, and that's why Kawhi's upset. Do so, you think he wants to be all things, like, he wants to stay in San Antonio, though, if they I, could fix it? Yeah, I, 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 think, I think he wants to be in San Antonio. I don't think it's that big of a problem where he wants to leave, but at the same time, some things have to be shaken up. You know, th this quote in the story that this was a seamless transition, it, I, don't, I don't know if it's been a seamless transition from the Duncan era to this new era. Because, again, Manu and Tony Parker are still representatives of an older era. Yes. And now, again, he had a problem with LaMarcus Aldridge that he had to solve last offseason. Another new guy, from not a part of the old era. And now Kawhi, they need to move on from Manu and, and Parker. All right, welcome back. Time for Last Call. Let's move to the NFL, where execs say the league is looking into modifying the kickoff rules once again in an effort to make the play safer. But they are not considering eliminating the kickoff entirely. Cowherd, are kickoffs worth saving? Um, I'm kind of back and forth on it. It's the most dangerous play. I wouldn't have a problem. I've, I've just learned there used to be huddles. There's no huddles. Uh, and I'm fine with that. I, I, if you got rid of it, I wouldn't watch any less football. I want them, after a touchdown, to punt from the opponent's 40. After a field goal, punt from your own 40. Punting, safer than kickoffs. All right, All right to Steph Curry who will return tonight against the Pelicans and said he hopes he doesn't suck after missing more than a month with a sprained knee. Vegas has set the over-under at 26.5 points for Steph tonight. Coward, are you taking the over or the under? Uh, I'm going to take the over because my gut feeling is his teammates will try to get him into the offense. My gut feeling is the under because they'll blow him out he won't play the fourth quarter. Uh, He'll only play 29 minutes tonight. That's a pretty good He'll call. He'll score 25 points. I do like the Raptors big tonight. Big. Like the Raptors big. big. And I don't bet the NBA, but if I did, all chips in. I don't in. like that.